In North Korea, a nation is in mourning. Their dictator for the past 48 years, Kim Il-sung, is dead. For the North Koreans, Kim Il-sung was a living god. And these people were being told that God was dead. They were shocked. Because they had been raised to think of him as a god, they didn't know that he was even mortal. But the myth of Kim's divinity concealed a darker truth. Behind the facade was a brutal ruler whose regime imprisoned, killed, and tortured hundreds of thousands. Kim Il-sung created an atmosphere of fear and paranoia. And everybody knew that they needed to get in line. He needed to have absolute control over the people. That means controlling what they think, where they work, what they eat. There's no country in the world that exercises more control and power over its citizens than North Korea. Ironically, the man who turned his country into a kind of prison spent much of his youth fighting for Korean independence. How did a man who risked his life for the freedom of his people become their oppressor and build one of the most controlled societies on Earth? Dictatorships have had an incredible impact in the past century. These dictators ended up learning from one another. They're all different, but many use the same tactics. The use of terror. Propaganda. Control the elite. Create an enemy. Cult of personality. Use violence. These are tools that dictators use to stay in power. The dictatorship Kim Il-sung created in North Korea still survives, nearly 25 years after his death. Kim created this system with himself at the apex of power that has lasted now for almost 70 years. It's been led by the same family, now onto the third generation. And that's really an extraordinary record. Today's North Korea, ruled by Kim Jong-un, remains a tightly controlled totalitarian state. If you study Kim Jong-un's ideology, his strategy, his policy, it is very similar to that of his grandfather, Kim Il-sung, but with a more modern bent. This is really one of the most isolated, most strictly regulated societies in the world. The seeds of this extreme dictatorship were sown more than 100 years ago in a time of turmoil for Korea. In 1910, the country was annexed by Japan. Japan's growing empire wanted Korea as an access point to strike at its rivals, China and Russia. For Koreans, decades of suffering were about to begin. The Japanese really put in a ethnic cleansing program. They changed the names of Korean citizens, and they basically tried to eradicate the Korean language. Those who resisted were tortured and executed. This is the world Kim Il-sung is born into in 1912, two years after the occupation began. In a village just outside the Korean city of Pyongyang, his parents name him Kim Song-ju. 
This is a kid who was named Songju, which means pillar of the country. And so he was expected by his parents to do something amazing. Kim's mother and father introduced him to Christianity as a young boy. Pyongyang was the center of Christianity in Korea. It was known as the Jerusalem of the East. Kim learns the organ and plays it in his parents' church. But just before his seventh birthday, his innocence is shattered. When his father is arrested for protesting against the Japanese occupation. His father was arrested during the 1919 independence demonstrations against the Japanese. Kim's father is involved in the local resistance movement against Japanese oppression. He and other protesters are jailed and treated unmercifully. Kim was taken to see his father in prison. And that image of his father, beaten, bruised, tortured, completely emaciated, was seared into his memory. Watching his father suffer instills in Kim a hatred of the Japanese. At 19, he commits his life to his parents' cause. He joins a communist guerrilla group battling the Japanese army in the mountains near the Korean-Chinese border. It's a very mountainous area, extremely hot in the summer, and bone-chilling cold in the winter, down to 40 degrees below zero. The absolute worst circumstances. Kim's success in raids against Japanese strongholds establishes his reputation as a heroic freedom fighter. He was a tall man for a Korean, over six feet tall, strong, smart, elusive, a really remarkable gorilla. By 24, Kim has risen through the ranks, leading hundreds of men in crippling raids on Japanese positions. As his fame grows, he becomes an almost legendary figure. By the late 1930s, Kim Il-sung is the most wanted guerrilla leader fighting the Japanese. They send divisions of men into the mountains to hunt him down. In 1938 and 39, the Japanese threw tens of thousands of soldiers against Kim Il-sung and other guerrillas. These were pitched battles on a major scale. The Japanese kill thousands of guerrillas, but not Kim. His fellow revolutionaries give him the name Kim Il-sung, meaning become the sun. And that's the name that stuck. Without being a guerrilla, there is no Kim Il-sung. You got press in the southern part of Korea, uh, Europe, China, Russia. I mean, it was all over the place. In the decades to come, Kim's legend as a freedom fighter will give rise to a defining feature of his dictatorship. The cult of personality is the idea that the leader possesses superhuman qualities, that the leader is a savior to the nation. Dictators build personality cults because it enables them to mesmerize the public, to ensure that the public adores them. Kim Il-sung was able to do it on a level that we've never seen before. In time, Kim's days as a guerrilla leader will provide the cornerstone of the cult of personality built around him. That was an enormous element of his prestige and legitimacy when he started out. Uh, and it, it remains the core legitimacy of the regime. But in the spring of 1941, Kim's dictatorship is a long way off. 
the guerrilla movement has been crushed by the Japanese. Kim and his guerrilla fighters are forced to flee. They take refuge in the last safe place left, the Soviet Union. The Soviet army embraces Kim for his resistance to the Japanese. They make him captain and put him in charge of some 160 Korean guerrillas. Kim and his guerrillas train for action against the Japanese. But in June 1941, Germany invades the Soviet Union, forcing the country to defend its western borders. Kim finds himself sidelined in the Soviet Far East. While waiting for action, he closely observes their iron-fisted leader. Kim Il-sung was a student of Joseph Stalin. He had immense respect for Joseph Stalin. Kim has begun a common stage in the development of many dictators. Dictators learn from each other all the time about how they rise to power, about how to deal with opponents, about how you maintain a dictatorship for decades on end. So for many dictators, Joseph Stalin is actually a role model. Stalin used his own cult of personality to secure his position and transform the Soviet Union into an industrial and military powerhouse. He cultivated an image that he was the father of the nation, that he was a strong leader. But he also was really adept at using fear to ensure loyalty. So for anyone that wanted to learn from Stalin, they learned quite a bit about the level of brutality that was needed, particularly in the beginning of the regime, to ensure mass compliance. More than 500 miles from home, Kim seems light years away from using such tactics. But with World War II coming to an end, things are about to change. While Kim is sidelined in the Soviet Far East, the Allies crush Hitler's armies in Germany. Sensing an opportunity, Joseph Stalin declares war on Kim's sworn enemy, Japan. Along with the United States, the Soviets drive the Japanese from Korea. Kim's dream since he was seven years old to see a Korea free from Japanese occupiers has finally been realized. But there's a complication. The Soviets came in from the north and the Americans came in from the south. And they agreed to divide the peninsula at the 38th parallel. Korea is now divided and controlled by two foreign powers. In the north, the Soviets need Koreans they can trust to help stabilize their occupation. They recruit Kim and send him home to Korea. His years of exile are over. He was brought to Pyongyang and installed by the Soviets as their man in Pyongyang. He was somebody that they saw could really carry out some of the Soviet objectives. The Soviets appoint Kim to a key position deputy commandant in Pyongyang. He acts as a liaison between Soviet occupying forces and local Koreans. It's his first taste of political power, and his ambition kicks in. He begins to envision himself as the one man who can bring North and South Korea back together again, and sets his sights on the leadership of the nation. 
But what motivated him, I mean, it was personal ambition plus the mission to build a country. He was motivated by a desire to make this country intact. But if Kim is going to become the ruler of Soviet-controlled Korea, he'll have to convince them he's the man for the job. Kim Il-sung's greatest strength was his charisma and his interpersonal skills. I think that helped him enormously. Kim gets a chance to use these skills in the fall of 1945, when resentment against the Soviets begins to build. Many Koreans feel they've traded one occupier for another. They want a Korea free from outside interference. When Korea was occupied by the Soviet Union, there was a lot of turmoil, a lot of uncertainty about the political direction of the country. The Soviets put communists in control, and a lot of people resented that. There came to be quite a bit of anti-communist sentiment, particularly among a lot of young people. November 23, 1945. In Shinwiju, a city on the border with China, Soviet and Korean forces cracked down on an anti-communist student protest. Sinwiju is a mess. Hundreds of people were injured, and there's estimates about 100 students died. Student protests against the violence erupt across North Korea. The Soviets send Kim to Sinwiju in a last-ditch attempt to restore order. It's the opportunity he's been waiting for. Kim was able to calm things down and to say the communists are not your enemy. We have to work together to uh, create a, a system for everyone. And uh, it really helped. He was uh, a natural hands-on leader. Uh, and I think maybe at Shinwiju that was first demonstrated. Prominent Soviets are impressed by Kim's skill in defusing the uprising. They put him in charge of the puppet government they've installed in North Korea. In February 1946, he became head of the, the first national government. And it's really from that time on that, that we can see Kim Il-sung's dominance of the North Korean system. Kim the guerrilla fought for his country's liberation for nearly two decades. Kim the politician has taken just four months to become its ruler. but he's still under the Soviet umbrella. To govern the country on his own, he needs to show the Soviets he can run a successful communist country that's loyal to them. He can only do that if he has the support of his people. Kim turns to a tactic familiar to many would-be dictators. When dictators first take power, they often try to get consent by appealing to as many people as, as possible, trying to please the masses, trying to ensure that they are loyal to them. They wouldn't want to incite some sort of revolution. The first way is that they try to provide the public with some kind of good and service like access to education, access to water, electricity. They may make gas much cheaper. They may be lowering taxes. They want to ensure that the masses feel that there's a need for this dictatorship. To win his people over, Kim makes a dramatic offer. Kim Il-sung announced a land reform. Peasants were given land free. They got three chungbo. Uh, which is a fairly small farm, but one that would sustain a family. For the first time in centuries, farmers can call the land their own. Giving them control over their land, giving them a sense of ownership again after hundreds of years of feudal rule and then these brutal 35 years of Japanese occupation gave the Koreans a sense of pride and a vision of a new Korea. Kim gives 2.4 million acres of land to more than 700,000 farmers and their families. 
And that's a huge boost to Kim's popularity. Now you have 70% of the Korean population which has directly materially benefited from the policies of the regime. So that was a very effective tool of getting popular consent for Kim. But Kim still needs consent from a group even more important than the masses. Elites are the biggest threat to any dictator. They have to make sure that this elite group is unified and incredibly loyal. If they can't do that, they are at risk of being overthrown. After using the carrot with the masses, Kim uses the stick with the elites, high-ranking communists and other rivals he doesn't trust. Kim was very shrewd in dealing with his enemies. He sent them to South Korea, people who had served the Japanese military officers, other Korean communists, all potential rivals. Over the next two years, Kim takes one more step to show the Soviets he's capable of ruling the country without their help by proving he can defend it. Building from a core group of some 200 of his old guerrilla comrades, he amasses an army of more than 60,000 soldiers. <laughs> By 1948, the Soviets are convinced Kim has a firm hold on the country. They begin to pull out. For the first time in almost five decades, North Korea is free from foreign control. And Kim is the undisputed leader. He finally has the power to go for his ultimate goal, one shared by many in his country, unifying North and South Korea. Kim wanted the peninsula unified as it had been for thousands of years before, under a single government. Kim Il-sung saw himself as the great unifier, a unified Korea without foreign troops. In the summer of 1949, Kim sees his chance. The U.S. has pulled most of its troops from South Korea. Its borders are now defended by 60,000 South Korean soldiers. When Kim doubles his army to 120,000 men, the South Koreans are outnumbered two to one. One year later, Kim invades South Korea. Kim's army steamrolls the outnumbered South Korean forces and pins them into a small corner of the country. He believes his dream of a unified Korea is about to come true. But Kim's made a major miscalculation. What he did not seem to understand uh, was that South Korea uh, had become important to the United States. Worried about the global spread of communism, U.S. President Harry Truman has appealed to the U.N. for support in defending South Korea. If the United Nations yields to the forces of aggression, no nation will be safe or secure. September 1950.
With Kim on the verge of victory, a UN force led by American troops carries out a daring counterattack. And pushes Kim's army north. Kim's shattered forces retreat across the 38th parallel into North Korea. The UN forces under American leadership came very close to wiping out Kim's regime. Kim's decision to make war on the Korean peninsula has pushed his forces to the brink of disaster. October 1. 1950. Kim Il-sung's army is trapped in a small corner of North Korea by U.S.-led U.N. forces. Desperate for help, Kim convinces China's leader, Chairman Mao, to support his communist cause. Three weeks later, Mao sends more than 250,000 troops across the Yalu River into North Korea and drives the U.S. back toward the 38th parallel. Not only does it save Kim's forces from annihilation, it resurrects his dream of reunifying Korea. But the U.S. strikes back with a brutal new tactic. The U.S. began just basically bombing everything, targeting schools, hospitals. It was just a brutal scorched earth air campaign. Pyongyang was level. Hamhung, level to the ground. Wonson, level to the ground. Tens of thousands of people die overnight. And this is devastating. More tonnage of bombs was dropped on North Korea than in all of the Pacific War between the US and Japan during World War II. The US bombing exacts a heavy toll on North Korean civilians. 20% of the nation, nearly 2 million people, lose their lives. It was the most unrestrained U.S. Air Force bombing campaign in the 20th century. It's a disaster for the country and for Kim. He was in a very deep pickle because he's the one who invaded the South with a lot of promises and it brought a Holocaust upon his country. July 1953, almost three years after it began in the wake of the U.S. bombing, the war ends in a ceasefire. Its exhausted combatants end up where they began, straddling the 38th parallel. It's an abject failure for Kim. His dream of unifying the country has been squashed. North Korea has been bombed into submission with a fifth of its population dead. And there were many around him who uh, criticized him for that. He was in a very weak position at that point because of his reckless action. But Kim has no intention of ceding his leadership. He begins to take a series of steps that will ensure his hold on the country for years to come. One of the first is a classic move from the dictator's playbook. For any dictatorship, they have to use force because they need to project this image of power, this image of control, this image that if anyone tries to threaten the regime, they will be dealt with. Kim immediately shifts the blame for the war from himself to his rivals publicly denouncing 12 senior communists who had criticized his handling of it. 
Kim's rebels were accused of collaborating with the Americans to, to sell out Korea. And they simply admitted to the charges, and then some went into exile, uh, others were executed. Kim Il-sung used purges, executions, to send a message to the elites and to the people that if they oppose him, that they won't survive. Like Stalin before him, Kim takes out suspected opponents. 2,500 in just four years. He just cashiered his enemies. What we can learn about Kim from that uh, particular period is that he's a vicious, ruthless leader who brooks no opposition. Although his most dangerous political enemies are dealt with, Kim must still convince the masses he's not to blame for their suffering during the war. He relies on a tactic that will become a trademark of his regime. Propaganda is the spread of information that benefits the regime. Dictators need propaganda to be able to control people's thoughts. They want to ensure that the masses are loyal to the regime. Kim uses a relentless stream of propaganda to create an alternate reality where the U.S. is an imminent threat to the safety of his people. That bombing of North Korea has been a memory kept alive to demonstrate how savage the Americans are. It's a reinvention of history, one that will be repeated again and again until millions of Koreans believe it. Kanun bo tiyakyorobuto iminakyo irangyongkaji. 그 학년을 높아할수록 미국이 일으켰다는 거예요. 6.25 전쟁을 미국이 일으켰다는 거예요. 정당에는 이제 미국이 먼저 휴전 협정을 제기했고 그래서 쟤들은 승리한 전쟁이라고 그래요. Kim's propaganda campaign continually reminds the people that he's the father of the nation. 100 million books are published to celebrate his greatness. But in order to fully seed his cult of personality, Kim needs to go out among the people. He travels across the country to spread his message in person. Kim really was a powerful personality and someone who was able to connect with the ordinary person. I compare him to Muhammad Ali in the sense that he would wade into a crowd as if everybody loved him and press the flesh. It was A, part of his megalomania, B, part of demonstrating to the Korean people that he was a hands-on leader. He just bathed in the adulation of his own people and seemed to think it was entirely deserved. By the late 1950s, Kim's cult of personality is flourishing. But his public confidence contrasts with a growing paranoia behind closed doors. Paranoia is a very dominant trait in dictators. It's a tendency that leads to projection of their own insecurities and suspicions. And their motivation becomes one of controlling every aspect of society. In his drive for control, Kim attempts to completely insulate the country from outside influences. He locks down all of its media and information sources. Both information internally and also information going in and out of the country. So keep the people aware of only the kinds of information that the regime wants them to know. They are actually forced to listen to the radio, which is only one channel all day long. They can turn it down, but they cannot change it. And so all day long, they are hearing how great Kim Il-sung is. 
Kim's obsession with his people's loyalty intensifies. He keeps them in line with a mandatory weekly program he calls Self-Criticism Sessions. Everybody was spying on one another. And everybody knew that they couldn't let any sign of disloyalty uh, be visible to, to anyone. By the early 1960s, after nearly two decades in power, Kim's grip on the nation has tightened. But he still sees conspiracies against him everywhere. To quash dissent, the regime makes fear and insecurity a part of daily life. A dictatorship needs to have a culture of fear in order to enforce a sense of loyalty to the leader. Fear of punishment is always going to be a part of a regime like this. By the mid-1960s, Kim Il-sung has created a culture of fear that envelops 12 million North Koreans. His parades demonstrate his power over the people. But it's not enough. Kim enforces their loyalty through the secret police, nearly 50,000 strong, who monitor their daily lives. The secret police is important to the dictatorship because they need to know who the opponents are of the regime. They need to get access to really good information. To identify threats, the secret police helps carry out a highly invasive plan. Around the country, agents gather personal information on every individual. The data is used to reinforce a rigid caste system, which ranks everyone into three categories based on loyalty. Within the three, Categories, there are somewhere between 75 and 95 subdivisions of the population. This determines what kind of work you're going to do, what kind of education you're going to have, where you're going to live. Only the most politically reliable people are allowed to live in the capital Pyongyang and the most unreliable people are out in the countryside. The caste system weeds out enemies of the state. The worst of the perceived offenders are sentenced to gulags. There is a system that has been used to use our family, and then they have to use the same thing. They have to use the same thing. 할아버지 때문에 갔지만 이제 아버지까지 다 끌려간 거지. 내 나이가 그때 아홉 살. 어, 대략 이제 한 3만에서 5만 명 정도 규모의 대규모 수용자였고 할아버지는 아예 다른 수용자 끌려가 가지고 뭐 아마 처형 당한 걸 알고 있고. 어. 
그러니까 육체적으로 감당하기 힘든 노동에 동원됐는데 짐승 같은 그런 생활의 연속인데 One of the harsh realities of North Korean detention facilities is they will be subjected to torture, sexual abuse, forced medical procedures. They keep the prisoners at a nutritional minimum so that they don't die um, because they want to prolong um, the suffering. 정신적으로 힘든 건 이제 가끔 이런 것들을 다 보게 하는데 목을 매달려서 죽는 사람을 처음 봤고 거기다가 돌을 던져서 또막 얼굴을 만시체 만들어 만시체 만들어 놓고 그러니까 이제 까마귀 띠가 밤새 날아와가지고 막 쪼아먹게 만들어, 만들어 놓고. During the 1960s, Kim's regime executes more than 6,000 political enemies. As the end of the decade nears, a culture of fear has permeated all corners of the country. The regime now controls even the most basic aspects of daily life. The government even dictates how much each person eats, rationing consumption through its food distribution policy. 어른은 700g 하루에, 뭐 학생은 600g, 그 밑에 학생은 500g, 또 집에서 노는 노인은 300g, 양식 300g. 그래서 항상 배고프다 할 정도로 배급을 줘야 된다는 거예요. 그래서 인민들에게 배불 인민들을 배불리 먹여놓으면 혁명할 생각을 안 한다는 거예요. 이거는 법이에요. Kim's indoctrination of his people reaches its pinnacle in mass rallies where they honor him as their supreme leader. The extent of the cult of personality is something like we've never seen before. It borders on fanaticism. It's complete socialization of everybody. Every single person in this regime is indoctrinated. Indoctrination and fear help explain why ordinary Koreans support the regime. But there are other forces at work, including history. For the past 600 years, North Koreans have never known real political freedom. They were either ruled by absolute Korean monarchs or the Japanese emperor. 우리 북한 지역은요, 자유민주주의 공기를 한 초도 맡아보지 못한 지역이에요. 자유란 공기도 맡아본 사람이 자유의 가치를 아는 거예요. Kim also exploits an intrinsic value of traditional Korean society. He tapped into a very Korean trait, which is conformism, understanding where your place in society is, and trying not to stray outside that place that's dictated for you. So. Koreans don't want to go outside the group. They want to do what the group is doing. By the early 1970s, Kim's cult of personality in North Korea is unshakable. In 25 years, he's gone from Soviet puppet to unassailable leader. But Kim's still haunted by one question. How can he ensure his regime continues after his death? Kim knows he's not going to live forever. He saw what happened in the Soviet Union after Stalin died. Confusion in the political leadership took the country in what Kim thought was a, the wrong direction. And he didn't want to have that happen in, in North Korea. 
he settles on a rare and unconventional plan for a communist dictator approaching the end of his rule. He looked to his family. After all, who do you trust more than the people within your own immediate family? Kim believes succession is the only way to guarantee his regime's survival when he's gone, even though it's never been attempted in the communist world before. He turns to his eldest son, 33-year-old Kim Jong-il, who's been serving as head of the regime's propaganda and agitation department. Kim Il-sung really grooms his son to be successor. He places him in increasingly important positions within the party structure. One of the key projects that Kim Jong-il develops is venerating his father, turning his father into the god figure. It's all part of Kim Il-sung's succession plan. To implement it, he deifies himself and his son and in the process raises his cult of personality to an entirely new level. The Kim regime was able to create a complete religion and myth around the leadership, that they were divine. And the myth started from the way that they portrayed Kim's childhood, that he was this idyllic character. And as he grew up, that he single-handedly defeated the Japanese. Kim's son, Kim Jong-il, is venerated as well. He was born in a Siberian village during World War II. But state propaganda says the birth occurred on a mystical mountain, Mount Pektu. All Koreans think of that place as the birth of the Korean people. And so to say that you were descended from Mount Pektu means that you've got like a godlike right to rule. During the 1970s, along with countless pieces of art and films glorifying Kim and his family, 34,000 monuments are erected in their names. They're now considered gods in North Korea. Kim is satisfied, his succession is in place, and he can kind of step back. From that point onward, Kim Jong-il is really doing a lot of the day-to-day -day governing of the country. In the 1980s, with his son basically running the government, Kim Il-sung attends to his own needs. By some estimates, Kim caused more than 200,000 deaths in his gulags, but he's obsessed with prolonging his own life to 120. To do it, Kim has set up the Longevity Research Institute, its only mission is to keep him alive. They used to gather men that were of the same height and weight and age as Kim Il-sung, uh, try medical treatments on them. 15 North Koreans were fitted with pacemakers to make sure the pacemakers were gonna work when they went to install the pacemaker on Kim Il-sung. Kim orders his doctors to give him dozens of blood transfusions from healthy young men. He spends hours around young children, hoping to absorb some of their energy. Handlers polish his rice grains so he doesn't get a bad one. But not even Kim can cheat death. On July 8, 1994, Kim Il-sung dies of a heart attack at 82. Some people said, I felt sadder at his death than I did my own father's death. So it shows you how deeply entrenched that uh, sense of loyalty was to Kim Il-sung. But there are other reasons for the people's tears. They needed to show that they were in genuine mourning. And if they didn't prove to the regime that they were in mourning enough, they could be arrested, they, they could be tortured, they could be killed. Around the world, political experts watch and wait, suspecting Kim's regime will crumble without him. It teeters, but survives. 
the strength of the dictatorship Kim forged passes another test in 2011, when it survives the death of Kim Jong-il. Once again, power is successfully transferred from father to son. Today, under Kim Jong-un, the regime has fortified itself through the emulation of its founder. Kim Jong-un's uh, clone of Kim Il-sung, his haircut is a classic late 1940s Kim Il-sung. They fatten him up so that he, he looks big, just like his grandfather. Kim Il-sung's cult of personality has never gone away. His presence is everywhere. There are songs, there are anthems, there are books, there are stories, there are statues, there are posters everywhere. You cannot escape it. In the end, Kim Il-sung did something no other communist dictator of the 20th century could pull off. He created a dynasty by passing on leadership of his country to his son. He engineered this hereditary succession. We had never seen anything like that in the communist world. Ironically, after struggling to free his people from the abuses of Japanese rule, Kim Il-sung created a system that brought more suffering to his people. <laughs> Today, North Korea is a nuclear state. Despite ongoing talks, it has not yet given up its weapons. The ramifications are far more terrifying than they were under Kim Il-sung. North Korea now has the capability to obliterate the region, frankly, uh, with these nuclear weapons. Kim Il-sung's dynasty has outlasted 12 US presidents and entered its eighth decade. But the question remains, how long will his creation, the world's most controlled and isolated society, last? I think this regime can last for quite some time to come. We can't dismiss the possibility they could fall, but I don't think we should ever underestimate how resilient and long-lasting this regime has been and can be in the future. To order the Dictator's Playbook on DVD, visit shoppbs.org or call 1-800-PLAY-PBS. This program is also available on Amazon Prime Video.